one, and I'd like to call the planning meeting of uh, March 3rd to order. Um, members of the public are advised that our meeting and our webcast live by the City Hamilton Archive and the City website, and that the presentation reports considered at this meeting are available on the City's website, and that the members of the public can contact the clerk's office to acquire documents in an alternative format. A reminder that all electronic devices are to be switched to a non-audible function during committee meetings. Members of the committee are reminded of the five minute time limit which we'll adhere to during the meeting. Members can submit another request to speak if they require more time to ask questions or make comments. Members of the public have five minutes to address the committee. Today, the planning committee meeting is being run on a hybrid meeting in anticipation of a time when you'll have the option of attending committee meetings in person or virtually. Councillors won't see any changes to the process for now and you will need to sign into eScribe for access to the agenda for votes and to get on the speakers list. For today, I'll ask for your patience during the voting process as there is a slight change in the way results are displayed, which will take a little extra time for the system to complete. So I'd like to announce that uh, quorum is just present. We have five, we need five. Uh, there's uh, two people have sent in regrets. And uh, so if you leave, we have to shut the meeting down uh, because we'll lose quorum. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, Chair Ferguson, there are changes. Under delegation requests, we have added delegations respecting 140 Garner Road East from Don McLean and Nancy Hurst. Under consent items, we have added 7.2 appointment bylaw under the Building Code Act, PED 22099. Under discussion items for 10.1, the appeal of draft plan of subdivision for 140 Garner Road East, we have added written submissions from Haley Van Sickle, Paula Grove, Neil Bonner, Harriet Woodside, Laurel Imson, Kevin Butter, Dennis and Patricia Baker, Margaret Tremblay, Janice Melnick, Ingrid Harris, Jan W. Jansen, Rick Johnson, Liz Seymour, Juanita LePage, Lynn and Rick Folks, Eileen McMillan, Carolyn Fair, David Wallace, Yvonne Piggott, Marjorie Middleton, Aaron Davis, Leanna Negro, Stan Nowak, Liz Koblick, Marlene Cameron, Lisa Hutchinson, Gudrun Bohm Johnson, Kathy Roon, Peter Appleton, Michael Gill, Cindy Jenkins, Jeff Smith, Teodora Filipova, Enrico and Julie Palmese, Patricia Cole Stever, Miriam Sager, Joanne and Ron Palangio, Lynn Nielsen, Daniel Coleman, Craig Kassar, Joyce Smith, Bruna Noda, Nancy Hurst, Akira Orik, Steve and Annette Vanderward, Marie Covert, John Gertz, Barbara Davis, Alita O'Connor, Chris and Jean Fitzpatrick, Libs Rabishaw, Cynthia Bernstein, Colin Seymour, Caramel Mothersill, Anne Washington, Marilyn Marchesu, Linda Hughes, Heather Vaughn, Carolyn Van Hovelock, Janet O'Sullivan, Louise McCann, Sarah Felice, Gord McNulty, Dorothy McIntosh, Peggy McKeel, Carol Ann Forster, Virginia L. Gibson, Lynn M. Gates, Aidan Amir, Susan Borghese, Eileen Booty, Janice Locke, and Michael Gill. And then we have added 14.2 under private and confidential, appeal of OLT for lack of division on subdivision application for 140 Garner Road East. That's it. Okay, may I have a move and a seconder to approve the agenda as amended. Moved by Partridge, seconded by uh, Maria Wolf Pearson. Uh, all in favor. Are any questions or comments on the, the changes to the agenda? Okay, the vote is up. That uh, carries. So, uh, members of the committee, are there any declarations of interest? Seeing none, we'll move on then to the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Can I have a mover and a seconder to approve the minutes of April 25th meeting as presented? Moved by Wilson, seconded by Dankel. Uh, comments or questions on the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor.
Okay, we'll move on to delegations requests. This is for 140 Garner Road East, uh, Don McLean and Nancy Hurst. Please note that the delegations approved for today's meeting will be heard under agenda item nine, public hearings and delegations. You will be called upon to speak after item 9.2 in order to appear in the agenda. May I please have a mover seconder to approve the delegation request for today's meeting. Moved by Wilson, seconded by Danko. All in favor? If consent item 7. <laughs> excuse me, 7.1, can I have a mover and a seconder to approve the recommendations in the report? Moved by Pearson, seconded by Partridge. And I got to go to the same movers and seconders on just to vote everything today with only five members present. So, Councilor Wilson, do you have a question? Forgers. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I do have a question uh, for staff. Um, just if you could just make, I want to make sure I clearly understand this. It's a, it's a regarding infill. It, it's to make it easier for residents to understand. But if I could just get a few highlights, please. And thank you. Was there a question in that, Councillor Wilson? Yes, I'm asking staff to give a, a highlight of what the consent item is about. So, so no I believe. Feedback. Yeah. Okay. I see Jason has turned his. Uh, his microphone on, so our camera on, Jason Thorne, go yes, ahead. Yes, through, through you, Mr. Chair, I was just going to introduce manager Bob Nuttall, who's the author of the report, and he can provide a brief overview. And can you introduce yourself too, Jason? Oh, and I'm Jason Thorne, general manager of planning and economic development. Okay. So we have, uh, go ahead, uh, Bob. Yeah, good morning, Bob Nuttall here, manager of the building inspection team, uh, through the chair. So this uh, consent item really, uh, upon approval of this bylaw previously, we sent off the approved bylaw to the Ministry, Ministry of the Attorney Generals to get uh, um, a set of approved short form wording for the purposes of enforcement of the bylaw. It just enables us to kind of streamline the enforcement of the bylaw through the issuance of tickets as opposed to um, kind of a longer drawn out process, which is uh, a part three charge to the Provincial Offences Act. Uh, an additional question then just to, uh, could you explain why it would be in the public interest to, to do this and uh, what it is that you're you're trying to what the bylaw applies to, please. Sure, and again, through the chair. So the intent of this bylaw really is to um, effect, I guess, uh, responsible development in the city. And to do that, this bylaw allows for the public notice process so that, so that there is uh, notification for community that development is underway. And failing to do that, failing to notify the, the community will result, you know, has to result in, in the enforcement of the bylaws. We need to make sure that uh, these notices are getting put up so the community community is aware of the, uh, of the development process for a property. Thank you. I appreciate through the chair uh, to, to staff for doing this. Um, I th if we're moving in the direction of infill because it's a financially sustainable and environmentally sustainable. I think we also have to um, enable the community around the area uh, to clearly understand the intent um, and to make it easier. Thanks so much for your work. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Curious item 7.2 is appointment of a bylaw under the building code. We've got to move into seconder to uh, move and second to approve the recommendation in the report. Moved by Danko, seconded by Partridge. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor. And that carries. Let's move on now to uh, 
uh, public uh, hearings and written delegations. Members of staff who are speaking at today's meeting are asked to state their name and title before speaking for the first time. The public has been advised of how to pre-register to be a virtual delegate at public meetings on today's agenda. Members of the public, in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that a person or body uh, does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council makes a decision regarding the development applications before us today. The person or body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Council of the City of Hamilton to the Ontario Land Tribunal and the person or public body that may be, not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Land Tribunal unless, in the opinion of the Tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. So the first one up is an application for zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 9270 um, Halderbrook Road in Glanbrook. Does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, both of these are in Ward 11, 9, 1, and 9, 2. And I spoke to Councillor Johnson, and she did send a note around to all of us that she was in agreement with the staff report. So I'm quite prepared to move uh, both of them if I can get a seconder, um, unless someone would like to see a staff report. But I think they're pretty straightforward, and um, I'm happy to move it. Thank you. So, Madam Clerk, can I move two reports at the same time? No, so we got to do one at a time. No. Yeah, no, that's fine. Just one at a time. Yep. Okay. So mover to waive the staff report, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Uh, discussion on waiving the report. The presentation. All in favor of waiving the, the presentation? Okay, Ed, uh, Ed Fothergill with Plan Fothergill Planning and Developments is in attendance. Ed, are, are you supportive of the staff recommendation? Uh, yes, it's Ed Fothergill. I'm the um, planner for the owner. Um, yes, we're in favor of the staff reports. Well done. I wanted to thank Mr. Toman and his crew for helping us through this process, uh, and everything seems fine. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any questions for the agent? Seeing none, a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation from the agent. Moved by uh, Pearson, seconded by uh, Partridge. Do you have a question, Councillor Pearson? I saw you wave your hand. Are you okay? No, I was respectfully suggest Councillor Partridge moves it, and I'll second it, please. She brought I'll it up. I'll have the next one, the approval okay. of the report. Okay. okay. Just All in favor of receiving the delegation or the, the owner's agent's representation. Not curious. May I have a mover to second to close the public meeting? Moved by uh, Partridge, seconded by Pearson. I'll make them all the same mover to second for the balance. Uh, all in favor? Councillor Pearson. Okay, can I move her to second, or, or that carries, can I move her to seconder that there were no public submissions received regarding the application? Same mover and seconder, all in favor. And that carries, and uh, may I have a mover to seconder, well, it's, it's Partridge and Pearson, uh, to approve the report recommendations as amended. I've, I'm always puzzled by that amended part when we didn't have an amendment. Oh. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Let's move on to 9.2. This is a zoning bylaw amendment for lands located at 1460, 1640, sorry, Trinity Church Road in Glenbrook. Does the committee wish to see the recommendation? I believe Pierce, uh, Partridge is, uh, Judy Partridge is going to waive it, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Um, all in favor of waiving the presentation? Okay, and Harvinder um, Wallace is the owner. The owner is in attendance. Harvinder, um, are you in support of the staff report? Can you turn your camera on? Oh, I see. Um, 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we hear you. I just need to know whether you're in support of the staff recommendation. I'm sorry? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions to the applicant? If not, I need to move her to seconder to receive the delegation from the owner. Moved by the same two people. And uh, all in favor? Okay. Can I have a mover and a seconder to close the public meeting? Same mover and seconder. Uh, all in favor? Can I have a mover, same mover to seconder that there were uh, no public submissions received regarding this application? All in favor. Same mover to seconder uh, to approve the uh, report recommendations as amended. Any discussion on it? Seeing none, all in favor. And that's carried. Uh, so now we'll move on to discussion items that carried. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Charles. Uh, you. you can turn much. the camera off now. Okay. 6.1 is delegations respecting 140 Garner Road. And uh, I believe Nancy Hurst is in attendance. So can you turn on your camera and your microphone, please? Good morning, I'm here. Madam Clerk, can you just turn ahead? the volume up in here? I'm having trouble hearing again. And just get right close to the microphone too, uh, Nancy. I will. Can you hear okay, me a little bit ahead. better now? You have Captain? five minutes. Thank you, sir. Good after, or good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and staff, and thank you for the chance to speak to you today. Um, I have timed my delegation. I should clock in at five minutes and 20 seconds, if you'll indulge me, please. And I do have some shares, uh, some slides that I wouldn't mind sharing if you would allow part of the way through. Uh, at last week's uh, special council meeting about Bill 109, I heard almost unanimous agreement among you about the negative impacts that this bill will have for Hamilton, and I truly share the sentiment particularly the increased role the OLT will surely play in local planning decisions, a role that's tilted very strongly in favor of developers and which eliminates public participation or input in local decisions. As you likely know, Toronto Developer One Properties acting on behalf of the new Edmonton owner of this property, AIMCO, Alberta uh, Investment Management Corporation, skipped the city and went straight to the Conservation Authority for a permit to pave the Gar Garner Marsh. That per permit was denied as this is a locally significant wetland and it is the headwater of Ancaster Creek. In response to the CA's denial, these developers are now trying a different tactic. They're appealing a long abandoned application that was filed with the city three and a half years ago in 2018 on the basis that the city did not issue a decision within 120 days. And it is noted on the staff report that there were several concerns with the application which were never addressed by the developer. This developer now wants the OLT to consolidate these two entirely separate appeals, the HCA's permit de denial and this long abandoned application filed with the city over 1300 days ago. This abusive process demands opposition and as such, I'm here before you today to ask that the planning committee do two things, to formally support the HCA's denial of the permit to pave the marsh and also to encourage the city's legal counsel to vigorously oppose consolidation of these two cases at next, next week's OLT case management conference on May 9th. If consolidation of these two appeals were to occur, the new case would be tried de novo, right from scratch. This will make it lengthy and expensive and further, it will exclude Hamiltonians from our right of public participation on a development file that directly affects our city's headwaters, wetlands, streams, creeks, and ultimately Coots Paradise. And if you'll allow, I will quickly share my screen. Are you able to see? Yep. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the Garner Marsh was um, amusingly, I believe, characterized by the developers at the Conservation Authority last June as a wet spot full of invasive Phragmites with one single American toad in residence. But honestly, nothing could be further from the truth. 
I've gone through several environmental impact studies for this and the neighboring lands, and I've pulled some species from them. And there is more life and biodiversity here than you would expect from a marsh whose water is mostly underground. And it should be noted that in addition to being prime run agricultural soil, the land at 140 Garner Road is identified as the highest level of significant groundwater recharge, which effectively means it's a giant sponge soaking up rainwater and protecting those downstream from flooding. An endangered Blanding's turtle was rescued from Garner Road directly across from the marsh and dozens of species make this place home or rely on it as a food source supplying insects and small animals which are found in abundance here. There is so much here that can be identified in one study and much of it has been missed. Page 121 of the environmental impact study notes that this land is not a candidate habitat for waterfowl stopover and staging areas. And yet it is in fact just that. Tundra swans return here every spring and rest, rest for a few days in the same spot beside the marsh before continuing their migration. So this leads me to wonder what else may have been missed from these studies. This is the location of the marsh on the property showing the headwater tributary of Ancaster Creek. And this is what is proposed or what was proposed to the HCA back in June, replacing an entire marsh fed by a cold underground spring <clears throat> that provides rare cold water habitat downstream and replacing that with an open water sun warmed pond and stormwater management system is simply not acceptable. They also want the removal of over 900 trees, including endangered butternuts. And this is not all that's planned for the AEGD. We're tracking at least five other massive warehouse plans on neighboring land that will eliminate headwater tributaries, thousands of trees, and surround wetlands with concrete. But aside from nature, there's also a human cost. Three leasehold farmers that used to farm 140 Garner Road, growing everything from ornamental flowers to horseradish to pumpkins, tomatoes, and peppers that were sold at Ottawa Street Market are now out of a job. And I say used to because in July last year, these crops were sprayed with herbicide to facilitate the sale of this land to AIMCO. And you can see the dying horseradish here next to the, those in the front that were missed by the, by the sprayer. Carrie Hewitson and Ron Book, and the books are, are, are four or five generation original settlers in Ancaster. They've been on this land for many, many years. Carrie Hewitson literally sat in a folding chair waiting for this industrial sprayer to enter the narrow lane that fed, that led yeah. to her field and was willing to stand in front of, the, of this uh, sprayer and stop it from spraying yeah. her crops because this is her livelihood. Nancy, are you, nearly, are you nearly finished because you're past the five minutes by your 20 seconds that you asked? Oh, okay. I have a duty to enforce the rules, I'm sorry. Can okay, you just I'll wrap just, it up? Yeah, well, the, the, uh, the outcome is that these folks have now sold and they're leaving. So we here in Hamilton are the losers because we have lost our ability to uh, um, get some nice, fresh local food and Ancaster farmers are the ones that are, that are the, the ones that are leaving. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Okay, any questions for the presenter? Can you just take the screen down, Nancy, so that we can, I can see the grid? Yes, I'm doing that. I'm just working on it. Any questions of the presenter? Yeah, Councillor Wilson. <clears throat> uh, thank you to the de delegate for taking time out and appearing and sharing part of her day with us. Um, I, I would just like to make sure I understand the scope here. Um, and so I'd like my questions, my questions will focus both on feature and function. Um, at present, this uh, parcel of land or part thereof is, as you're saying, is, is serving as an agricultural um, activity. It's prime agricultural, did you say, through the chair? Through the chair, yes. Ma'am, the land is prime agricultural soil and it was serving as agricultural land up until July last year when the crops were sprayed and everything was killed off. So uh, this year there are no plantings anticipated. No plantings anticipated, okay. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the function, uh, 
So the feature is there is a, a the Ancaster Creek runs on the east side, and there is a significant, to use the words of the Hamilton Conservation Authority, there is a significant wetland on site, um, and there's a cold water creek. Is that a correct um, description of the feature through the chair? Yes, through the chair, the marsh is the headwater of that creek. The water seeps up from underground. It fills the marsh and the marsh overflows into that small tributary of the Ancaster Creek, which then flows under uh, Highway, uh, sorry, Garner Road and mm -hmm. towards the Gulf and Country Club. So it is a rare cold water feature because there aren't that many cold water uh, features in Hamilton. So the Ancaster Creek is otherwise known as Coldwater Creek for a reason because it comes from that cold water that uh, comes from underneath the Garner Marsh and then flows downstream towards Coots. Thank you, through the chair. So I'm, I'm trying to learn a lot about the difference between what the significance of, of cold water and the proposal as it's before, uh, will be before the LLT is to hold the water in place and thereby warming the water. What would be, in your opinion, um, the impact of that uh, to a cold water creek? Because I guess that's my first question. And secondly, what is the um, importance of a cold water creek to the um, ecological system through the chair? Through the chair, uh, there are certain species that will only survive in a cold water environment. And I, uh, one that springs to mind is the red side days. Uh, certain species will not survive as the water warms. So you're correct in your um, characterization that if this underground soppy, wet, mushy marsh is switched to a pretty pond that is warming in the sun, then the cold water creek will no longer be a cold water creek. It will be supplied by not only a warm water stream, but a stream that is, if a development occurs all around it, certainly going to be filled with salt, sediment, and uh, oils and different sorts of um, chemicals that will be coming from the parking lots that surround it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, speaking of the parking lot, um, to the best of your ability, would you be able to describe the proposal as, as we presently know it through the chair? Yes, through the chair. Uh, the proposal that was provided to the Hamilton Conservation Authority, um, if it's, it takes up pretty much the entire property, which is 89 acres. It, it's uh, consisting of many large buildings. Um, I don't know that they have a tenant lined up for it, and we're not sure exactly who would be the tenant of this building. But um, there are certainly hundreds and hundreds of parking bays, uh, truck loading zones, um, staging areas. And this, uh, I would also add, is going to be only accessible from Garner Road, which is at this point <laughs> a two-lane road mm -hmm. on a sleepy country village um, with definitely homes right across the road from it. So, I mean, we all know that neighbors will complain about parking and things like this, but this is, this is, this development has the ability to receive um, hundreds of trucks. So I'm not quite sure how they'll even access this, this land from Garner Road. Thank you. And through the chair, um, I'll be seeking some clarification from staff, but I thought you made a point in your present presentation, uh, Ms. Hurst, to say that those impacts of those um, transports, I would imagine they would be um, at least five axles, perhaps, um, that impact on the um, Garner Road neighborhood and the vicinity, did you state that it was not assessed by the assessed in the in the application by staff. Thank you. Yeah, the staff report's coming up next after we see the delegations, and you can ask questions to staff at that time if you like. I will. But I questions? have a question. I have a question. That question. You have another question. To, that question was posed. Can you to get the, the microphone a little closer to you, Councillor? Because I'm I'm straining to hear you. Thank you. That question was posed to the delegate. She made Which reference. Question? She made reference that. Um, the community, in her opinion, the community interest in this application is broader than uh, perhaps is known. And I thought I heard Ms. Hurst say that the traffic impact on Garner Road, which I think she just described as uh, two lane, had not been assessed or perhaps her, the neighbors were not aware. Could she confirm or clarify? Thank you. 
Um, I can confirm that the neighbors directly across from um, this area, just sort of to the left and the right, because I believe that this, first of all, the city needs to be um, involved in order for the neighbors to be alerted. And since this application went first to the Conservation Authority mm. as a permit uh, to pave the marsh, then nobody was informed about that because that's not the job of the Conservation Authority. It would only be done through the city. Um, further, if it just goes to the OLT, then nobody again will be informed because this is not the OLT job to notify the neighbours either. So. If the only way that the neighbors within 120 meters would be informed is if this application is kept here and goes through the proper city channels. And I would argue even then, 120 meals from, a, uh, sorry, 120 meters from a massive farm field might only include two or three neighbors. Mm -hmm. So um, that's another thing to keep in mind is that I, I do know people that live in the townhouse de development straight across. And they have a little Facebook group, and I've sort of been on there and saying, hey, does anyone know about this? And nobody knows about this. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. That was an important um, note. I appreciate you explaining that to me, that the public has not yet been able to participate. Thank you. Those are my questions. Yeah, the, the, uh, the question about the road widening that's proposed in the airport in Plymouth Growth, Growth District would be suitably asked to staff after uh, we get into the presentation. Is there any other questions or comments from anyone? Seeing none, motion. Oh, no, I'm going kind to of go on to the second delegation. We'll receive both at the same time. So I'd like to call on Don McLean. Go ahead, Don. Okay, can you hear me? And thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, like Ms. Hurst, I strongly share your concerns about the Ontario Land Tribunal and the changes that are being imposed by the provincial government. The item 10.1 appeal was launched, uh, as uh, Ms. Hurst noted, more than 1,300 days ago. Um, and uh, it was launched actually by different owners, not the original applicants. Uh, so I think this is a particularly abusive use of the OLT in this appeal process. So my first suggestion is that you direct your OLT legal team to challenge the, leg the legitimacy of this effectively abandoned application and an appeal of it. The appellants also want to consolidate this appeal with another one that they launched last June against the Hamilton Conservation Authority that Ms. Hurst mentioned, uh, and that concerns the HEA's denial of a permit to destroy the marsh and segment of the headwaters of Ancaster Creek in return for a promised replacement wetland. The attempted consolidation is the subject of an OLT case management conference next Monday. As Ms. Hurst has noted, the plans provided to the HCA are very different from those made over three years ago to the city, and those are in the staff report. Uh, and Ms. Hurst pointed, uh, showed you a, a slide of what they're now proposing, or at least proposed in June last year to the HCA. Uh, the new proposal includes well over 200 truck bays by my count and more than 1,000 parking spaces. What are the impacts on Garner Road and Ancaster residents who have not been told about this proposal? What are the stormwater runoff impacts of this much impervious surface replacing active agricultural lands? What are the ecological effects, the impact on the downstream flows of Ancaster Creek? If the two appeals are consolidated on May 9, the HCA and other opponents of the development will face a much longer and much more expensive hearing. The city's planners and lawyers will also face this. If the two appeals are consolidated, what started as an appeal of an HCA permit decision becomes something much larger. The proposal and all its details will be determined by the OLT. The city's input will be limited to the OLT process. The outcome will be decided by a single OLT officer. The extensive city concerns about the application that are described in today's staff report will not be answered by the developers. Nearby residents, and the public will be excluded from commenting on the new development proposal, except by writing a letter to the OLT that we know won't be read. Since the original application was filed, the city has declared a climate emergency. Last year, council also voted overwhelmingly to protect food lands by freezing the urban boundary. This proposal eliminates dozens of hectares of prime agricultural land, currently supplying the local vegetable and flower markets, or up until last year was, 
It significantly increases the risk of excessive stormwater flows from extreme weather events that we know are becoming more frequent and more severe. So I recommend that you take the following steps. One, formally support the HCA's denial of a permit to the developer. Two, on May 9th, oppose the consolidation of the two appeals as unfair to the HCA and to other Marsh defenders. Three, tell the OLT the earlier development application was abandoned and should not be subject to appeal for the following reasons, because the application is over three years old, because the ownership of the land has, not, has changed, the development proposal has dramatically changed, because the extensive city concerns about the application were not answered by the developers, because the city has declared a climate emergency since the original application, and because the public is being excluded from commenting on the new development proposal. And failing that, please ensure that all nearby residents know about and can seek involvement in the OLT process and why it is abusive to democratic decision-making. And I recognize that this may not be something council can uh, do as much about as I would like to see them do uh, the process of, of OLT taking over city planning is clearly a problem uh, that you recognize and I hope that you can deal with. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any questions for Don? Councillor Wilson. Thank you very much, Dr. McLean, uh, for your constant uh, willingness to advocate for what you believe is right. Um, I'd like to go back uh, to the feature and the function if I could. And the reason I'm doing this chair is because um, I think it's fair to say uh, that for the overwhelming majority of Hamiltonians, um, we have a little appreciation of the importance of, of water courses and wetlands. And perhaps that, the case, that is the case because uh, we have over the last 100 years buried water courses and destroyed, I think, 90% of our wetlands, which are um, play a huge role in our efforts to combat um, and deal with carbon and the impact of that. For example, uh, as we learn from the tragedy of Shadow Creek and the 24 billion liters of sewage, we know that 70% of Shadow Creek is actually buried. So to that end, as part of our effort to understand this, Mr. McLean, Dr. McLean, could you just uh, overview for us um, the the water course itself and where it uh, travels ultimately and its importance. Um, the water course. Thank you for the question, uh, uh, Councillor Wilson, and through the chair. Um, the water course originates in uh, three to four locations uh, uh, on this property and uh, adjacent to this property. Uh, these are the headwaters. Um, and uh, it seems to appear uh, on the Garner Road, 140 Garner Road property from an underground spring. Um, it then goes uh, across uh, Garner Road uh, as a stream uh, and uh, through the Ancaster Golf and Country Club and uh, Ancaster mm -hmm. neighborhoods um, under Rousseau Street uh, near uh, Wilson, uh, then under Wilson and it uh, is most visible to people uh, at the Ancaster Mill. Uh, that's where most people would recognize Ancaster Creek. Um, it flows uh, pretty much through the mill, as you know, if you've ever eaten there, and I'm sure most of you have, uh, and then goes over Sherman Falls, goes through some um, more private property, uh, through the lands that are now owned by McMaster uh, along uh, Lower Lions Club Road, um, and under the rail trail, uh, that uh, the Dundas Valley Rail Trail, where it crosses uh, uh, that area, just uh, uh, to the west of um, just to the west of Main Street, um, and then uh, combines in, along the way combines with and um, uh, other creeks to form what's now called Coldwater Creek. Uh, goes behind McMaster, where a large uh, uh, restoration project is uh, being developed by McMaster to recreate a marsh uh, in what is now a parking lot uh, just off Coots Drive, uh, and then joins Spencer Creek and goes into with through Spencer Creek into Coots Paradise. So that's its route, roughly, uh, and uh, along the way, uh, uh, 
it's sometimes visible, sometimes not very visible to people. There are spots where you can see it, certainly at Sherman Falls, Ancaster Mill, and uh, the rail trail are prime ones, and behind McMaster where this wetland is, uh, is being proposed. Does that, I hope that answers your question, Councillor. It, it does. Uh, did, you, did you have something you wanted to add or do you want to wait till the staff report comes up, Steve? You, you left the screen, Steve. Did you have something you wanted to comment on? Okay, let's go back to you, Councillor Wilson. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, it's an elaborate <laughs> uh, stream, but important nonetheless. Um, and I didn't appreciate that it actually flows into to Coots Paradise um, and then ultimately the harbor. Um, so I just want to, and I'll be seeking clarification from staff chair, but uh, through the chair to uh, the delegate, um, the, the democratic deficit, which you're alleging um, as part of this, I just want clarity. The original application was submitted to the city in 2018. Um, but has subsequently been appealed for non-decision. Um, so there was not an opportunity for the public to participate in a, any sort of statutory meeting. And then you're saying they'll be forced to do so um, at what you're alleging will be an expensive um, kind of out of reach um, tribunal. Can you just clarify where you'd like, where you wished the public could participate? Thank you through the chair, and that's my question. Uh, through the chair, thank you again for the uh, question, Councillor. Um, my understanding of the process, and I've been following planning committee, as you know, for many, many years, uh, is that uh, if someone wants to develop a piece of property, they make an application to the city. The city uh, runs it by uh, uh, its various departments to get input and comment. It uh, uh, notifies people in the neighborhood. Uh, it then uh, would go through a public meeting process uh, where uh, anyone could come and speak and address this. Uh, and the current, the problem here is is twofold. Uh, as I understand it, neighbors within 120 meters were notified of the original application. The original mm -hmm. application, unfortunately, is not what we're dealing with at this point. The original application left the marsh in place. Uh, there was uh, an issue of how big a buffer the developers mm -hmm. were proposing to uh, preserve. Uh, they weren't meeting the uh, the minimum targets, uh, the minimum requirements of the Conservation Authority. Um, but uh, uh, that application is not the one that we're now facing. Uh, and as uh, you're probably aware, when you get to the Ontario Land Tribunal, the former OMB, uh, we start over. Uh, and the developers can come in with a, a th entirely new application uh, or an entirely new plan of what they want to do on the property. And that's what they've done to the Conservation Authority uh, uh, last June. So if you compare that plan to the one which was presented to the city back in 2018 and is now being appealed, uh, they're two quite different beasts uh, and they result in quite different impacts. Uh, the uh, particularly to the stream and marsh, but also much larger area is being uh, paved over. Uh, and uh, we're now seeing uh, in the application that was uh, presented to the Conservation Authority last June uh, that this is going to be uh, uh, five large warehouses with, uh, as I said, by my count on their, vi on their visual, over 200 truck bays, uh, maybe 300 uh, is quite a large number. Uh, a thousand parking spaces or more. So uh, that's the kind of proposal that people haven't seen. Uh, unless you were at the Conservation Authority meeting, uh, you don't know anything about this. And even if you were at the Conservation Authority meeting or followed it, unless you'd ask, asked to address the Conservation Authority, you didn't even get to speak about it there. Uh, and certainly you're not getting to speak about it where we should as normal process at City Council. This decision-making process for land use is the fundamental uh, power that municipal governments have. And it appears to be being taken away by this uh, uh, revival or resurrection of a, an application that is over three years old. Uh, and uh, the uh, developers, the new owners of this property want to take that application 
and use it as a means of having the entire plan, not just whether they get a permit from the Conservation Authority, but the entire plan uh, and their proposal approved by the OLT. And as I pointed out, that's a very difficult process for citizens to participate in. Uh, you can apply to be a party. Uh, for that, you need to have a lawyer, uh, and the lawyer has to be at all days of the hearings. Uh, it is a very expensive process for an individual, um, and I've been involved in a couple of these OMB uh, is involved in that. Uh, so the option is to send a letter, uh, and you only send a letter if you've actually been notified that this is going on. And in this case, people will know about it to some extent because of the efforts of people like Ms. Hurst and myself and others. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. there is no formal notification going on to the uh, uh, to the citizens, as far as I understand. And uh, uh, even if it is, all they do is get to write a letter, a so-called participant statement, um, which uh, we've been advised over and over again is not paid attention to at all by the Ontario Land Tribunal. What they do in the Ontario Land Tribunal hearings by starting over is they rely on the experts that appear before them. Citizen letters are not considered experts, uh, so they don't have any weight in the decision process. You as a council and we as a city are paying our staff and our lawyers to go there and try to defend the city's interests and the public interest. Uh, but this is not the way it's supposed to happen. The way it's supposed to happen mm -hmm. is right here in the planning committee uh, where everybody gets a chance to speak and everybody gets a chance to participate. Uh, and the council makes the decision, not some individual bureaucrat appointed by the provincial government. I hope that okay, answers that. So you're well over your five minutes. Do you have any further questions? Because I don't have anybody else on the speaker's list. No, I have questions for staff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I see there's no other speakers. Can I have a motion to receive both delegations? Moved by Partridge, seconded by Pearson. All in favor. Blocks uh, located at each of the, the northeast and southwest corners, or the woodlots and the uh, uh, the open space areas, as well as the um, the wetland block and stormwater management block located um, along the east side of the plan. Uh, this plan had shown where the current uh, wetland has been uh, surveyed at that at that time. Um, as well as a network of public roads. Uh, again, this is the original draft plan application that was submitted in 2018. Um, and there was an appeal filed with the ULT on December 13th of 2021, which was received by our, our office, uh, city clerk on February 1st. Uh, there's also the uh, appeal, the decision of the Hamilton Conservation Authority to refuse to issue the permit for the relocation of the water course in wetland. Uh, that matter is being addressed separately uh, as part of that process. And then just, and in summary, uh, the circulation of the original application 2017 raised uh, a number of uh, concerns uh, regarding the natural heritage features, uh, servicing and transportation infrastructure complaints and, and some other uh, technical um, matters to be addressed. Um, the application was sent to residents within 120 meters of the, of the subject lands. And at the time, we received four written submissions with some concerns uh, related primarily to traffic along Garner Road, uh, the types of employment uses um, that would be proposed, and uh, resulting noise, odor, and property values, as well as with the existing bodies of water and uh, the presence of standing water uh, from that. So um, yeah, that concludes my brief overview and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Wilson. You just take your uh, uh, yes. screen down, there we go. Uh, thank you, Tim, for the overview. Uh, I just have a couple of questions uh, seeking clarity on some of the chronology and some of the participants and some of the concerns. Um, so right off the bat, um, my understanding, and it's, I think, set out in the report that was certainly raised by the delegates, is that there has been a change in ownership of this. This was uh, originally this application was um, under the ownership of, is it Silvestri? And now it's under the ownership 
uh, and the appeal has been set by the by Ontario Holdings Inc. Is that correct through the chair? Tim. Through the chair, that is correct. The original applicant was uh, Sylvester Holdings Inc. And the appeal uh, that has been filed, um, yeah, it's Ontario Holdings Inc. is representing the, the ownership group. Um, okay. Thank you. Through the chair, who is Ontario Holdings Inc.? Do you know? Who, who the principals are? Who's, who's, who is this? My understanding, so they are, they're the holding company that's represented by the Alberta Investment Management mm -hmm. Company, and the property manager is One Properties Limited. Yes, thank you. Are you able to identify through the chair just who any of the principals are in Ontario Holdings, Inc., through the chair? Through the chair, the uh, any identification of the principals that I uh, may be aware of would be uh, referred to, uh, if you could refer to Appendix C of the report in the letter, there's the uh, the CC list, and that identifies. Uh, I missed one, that. One you name it out. One individual on the uh, the CC list on the Appendix C of the report. Through through the chair. Sorry, Tim. I missed that. Could you identify it on the public record, please? So I, I'm just pointing out for the the chair on the the appendix C to report to PED two two zero nine six. I don't have the page number of the full agenda uh, available, but uh, in referring to the CC list, there is an S Savelli of One Properties Limited Partnership. That is the only individual that uh, S Savelli. Did I have some? Did I did I would have any? Did I have information for based on that? Um, but the only communication um, that I've had is through the um, the planning consultant. Thank you. Anything further? I could. I may defer to uh, to legal staff if they have anything. Any further uh, information through, through the through the chair? Is legal able to enlighten us on who any of these principals are as part of the Ontario Holdings Inc. Patrick, you, you wanted, I know that I think Urban Solutions is the uh, is a planning consultant, and uh, I think uh, Tim mentioned that Stefan Sorelli is the, one of the principals with uh, um, One Properties. Is that what it's called, Tim? The holding company. Victor, yes, it's One Properties. Just the. So Patrick, anything more? Contract. You know, I, I think Tim's concerned. I read, if I could read his body language, he's concerned about privacy rights. And um, so can you help us out with that, Patrick? Um, through the chair, yes. So um, Councillor Ferguson's correct that the agent uh, here is Urban Solutions. Uh, in terms of the owner, uh, yes, it is one property at present is my understanding. In terms of the principles of that, um, I would have to consult the appeal forms um, to confirm who those principles are. Thank you. Um, through the chair, then to the Tim, um, the original application uh, was deemed complete in November of 2018. Is the um, the uh, the appeal with respect to the original application or anything since then? Is that what's being appealed through the chair, please, Patrick? Or Steve, uh, through the chair, so the 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 timing of the appeal was such that the original application was under appeal. Obviously, as um, Mr. Ruman mentioned, there has been a subsequent application. Whether the owner is adopting that as their revised submission is for them to determine, and we may get clarity on that at the May 9th appearance. But because that was filed subsequent to um, the appeal being filed, the, that's that's really the owner's call for which one they're pursuing. So sorry, through the chair to uh, Solicitor McDonald. I just want to make sure I, I understand that we will know this, 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 the um, the nature or the the applicant, which is the application. We'll have clarity on which application is going to be appealed uh, 
uh, I think one of the delegates mentioned a case management conference on the 9th, but could you just clarify that? I'm, I'm, I've read the report. I'm just seeking clarification on what is actually being appealed here. I know they're appealing the HCA permit. They're also appealing a non-decision, but what application is being ap appealed here through the chair? Councilor Wilson, you're over your five minutes, so if you like, I can put you yep. back on the speaker's list. Thank you. Uh, do you want to answer that question, Patrick? Uh, yes, thank you. So through the chair, um, again, so the on the subdivision portion, um, applicants, as with uh, OPAs and rezonings, applicants are entitled to amend their application after the appeal. Um, mm -hmm. That may obviously impact the positions of the other parties. It may impact the whether the hearing needs to be rescheduled, things like that. So again, um, it, it is a hope that that will be clarified on May 9th. But again, that is that is entirely within the applicant's purview as to what they are choosing to pursue and any impacts that would arise should they decide to change the application before the tribunal in the subdivision versus what was appealed, which was the 2018 submission. Um, with respect to the HGA permit appeal, um, that's under the Conservation's Authority Act. So mm -hmm. the application there would be the permit appeal. It would not be the, the form of the subdivision itself. It would be more constrained in nature. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, that's if you could put me back on. on. Yeah, just put, keep your microphone on too, because I'm going to turn the chair over to you now and oh. uh, ask, ask to have some questions. Thank you. Okay. Please proceed. So, um, first of all, to, to either, um, I guess to uh, Steve Robeshaw or even Patrick, uh, is this, this property is located in the Airport Employment Growth District, is it not? Steve might better be able to answer Ms. that. Tim, Tim, are you able to answer that? You're a present on the screen. Thank you. The chair, yes, these lines are located in the Airport Employment Growth District. Thank you. Okay, and that the airport employment lands uh, were approved by council in the early 2000s, weren't they, as part of our employment land strategy? Am I correct on that? Mr. Tim? I, yes, I, want, I, I think you're council muted. in 2006, it was approved by then. I think you're muted, Tim. So the chair, yes, the... The Airport Employment Growth District uh, was adopted in the year 2000s. Thank you. Councillor? So, so the answer to that was yes, it's in the early 2000s in there. Okay. And and so um, I, th I think I know I'm frustrated and I, I'm almost positive every member of council is frustrated by the new process where we're limited to 120 days. This is to, to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And um, you know, I, for the life of me, I don't understand why they're appealing the city's permit application because um, as of right, they can do this development. Uh, all they need is a subdivision agreement approved, I think. And then I see Steve slipping through a lot of papers there, but is, is that not correct, Steve, that they, as of right, they can, this development can proceed because it's in the airport employment growth district? But they, they didn't need an official plan amendment or a zoning bylaw for it. They just needed something else. Could you just explain that to the committee and the public, what it is that they they need to get approval from the city on? Uh, through the chairman to the board councillor, Steve Robichaud, director of planning and chief planner. Uh, the board councillor is correct. These lands were are formed part of the airport employment growth district, which was approved by the OMB circa 2010 based on council's adoption of the secondary plan and implementing zoning. So these lands are designated in the official plan and the secondary plan for employment type uses. And they are also zoned for employment type uses with a holding provision. That holding provision relates to the applicant uh, demonstrating that they're implementing the transportation master plan and the water and wastewater master plan. And what would be required to do that would be what the previous owner did was to apply for approval of a draft plan of subdivision we would review and assess that draft plan of subdivision and bring forward a report to, to allow for the creation of the lots and the future street. But the principle of the land use has already been established through the AEGD secondary plan that was previously adopted by council and approved by the OMB. Thank you very much. Okay, and Thank so um, I just want to set the record, paint the picture, set the record straight of where we are in the process on this. And so uh, I'm puzzled why they're appealing 
um, the application to the city when they already have approval to do the, the, the development and, and they got to solve the water, the wastewater issues and transportation issues. But if they can do that, I don't think that the, uh, through you, Madam Chairman, Steve, that the city would probably not oppose that if they met all those conditions. Is that correct? I know I don't want to get ahead of yourself because you don't have a report in yet. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, there is um, an in-camera matter seeking further instructions on this matter, but if uh, hypothetically, uh, this property, yeah, you are correct. If they um, they could proceed straight to a you know approval of draft plan of subdivision and provided it met all of the city requirements as it related to engineering, traffic, uh, grading, stormwater management, as well as protection of any environmental features based on the site, then there would be uh, staff would would have been in a position to bring forward a positive recommendation. Um, we would, you know, the previous owner of the property had made a, a submission and a resubmission to the city. We provided feedback and we were waiting for a revised submission and then it was subsequently sold to the new owners who changed the plan. Um, but we, and we hadn't had an opportunity to fully complete the evaluation of that revised plan before they made the decision to appeal it to the OLT, which is their right under the Ontario Planning Act. As it relates yeah, to the know, Conservation the Authority, that was percent. changes in the okay. legislation. My apologies. Sorry, Councillor Ferguson, can we get, let the staff and Mr. Robichaud finish, please? Sorry, I just wanted to point out that it was um, recently the government did through some of the reforms that they've made to legislative reforms or changes that brought in the process now where the Conservation Authority permits are now to appealed to the OLT. Um, however, as to what is the applicant strategy, that's not a matter that I could comment on um, because that is essentially what is their strategy how they want to advance their development application. Thank you. My apologies. Okay. Uh, no problem. need to apologize, Steve. And so uh, now that I've painted the background picture for members of the committee and for the public where we are in the process, I'm completely puzzled why they're taking us off to the Ontario Land Tribunal, although it just seems to be the process for developers today is to just give the city the finger and, and go, move right on to the Ontario Land Tribunal. I don't have a clue why they're combining these two now. And But as Steve said, this is the process they're permitted to do and under the, um, the, the provincial legislation, so we can't stop it. Um, I, I believe, and in, in if Patrick is, is still around, I, um, I have a question for you on, from a legal perspective, Patrick. If you're there, there you are. Uh, so Patrick, the city will be, I assume, taking the position to support the HCA at the Ontario Land Tribunal, won't they? Won't we? I, I think this is a discussion matter uh, for us to have subsequently. Uh, there is an in-camera item. Uh, Mr. S uh, Solicitor McDonald, did you wish to comment? And you're closing in on your six minutes, Councillor, just to let you know. Uh, through the chair, thank you. The, yes, there is a um, a confidential report in camera that will discuss some of these items, and um, that would be more appropriately discussed in that forum in camera at that time. Thank you, Councillor. You're at six okay, minutes. Okay, because I know that the delegation were wondering what if they want us to take the position of supporting the HCA, and uh, we're going to hear that in camera. And um, it's too bad we can't. Uh, I can't give a comment on that, but I'll. I'll I'll stop talking now. I just wanted to give some comfort to the delegates and to the public that uh, there is a process and, and uh, the city will, I guess, be taking this matter in camera because I'm not permitted to tell you now. So that's all my questions. I'll take the chair back. And is there any other members, Madam Clerk? Just Councillor Wilson to her second time? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Wilson, for a second time. Thank you, through the chair. So I'm just seeking clarity uh, through the chair to, Ms. to, to Tim. Um, is there a planning application submitted to the city for the current proposal? The chair, the application before us is the application that was submitted in 2018. Uh, and, yeah, sub and then subsequent to the filing of the appeal, there's uh, the proponent has brought forward a revised submission, and the intent is that, that would be brought forward as part of the um, same application. But uh, as a, as a, Mr. McDonald had uh, spoken to, that there, those discussions are something that would need to be. Um, oh, 
Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I, sorry, I just didn't hear the end of the sentence. Thank you. I, I think I got it. Um, are there any municipal planning approvals in place for either development proposal through the chair? Through the chair, uh, as noted, the, the draft plan subdivision application is the current planning act application that is before us, and there has been no approvals. Okay. That application today. Thank you. Um, I will have uh, likely the rest of um, my comments. I, I actually did have a question of, of clarification, if I could, uh, through the chair to a comment that Mr. Robichaud made. When I was reading uh, Mr. Robichaud, um, the Hamilton Conservation Authority uh, staff report, um, which recommended a denial um, of the application because they believed it was contrary uh, to the Conservation Act and the responsibilities therein. I thought I read in that report um, that an official plan am amendment may be required to facilitate the removal and the reloc relocation of, th of the wetland. But I, I thought in response to a question from my colleague, you stated otherwise. Could you clarify that? Uh, through you, Miss. Uh... Through you, council, through the council, through the chairman to the councilor. I apologize. Um, this wetland feature is not identified in the AEGD secondary plan. Mm -hmm. um, there is an opportunity where a wetland gets uh, is identified or a feature gets identified through a study or planning review process, then mm -hmm. to incorporate it into the official plan. But as it relates to this specific wetland, it was not identified in the sec when the, at the time of the preparation of the original secondary plan, circa 2010. Mm -hmm. um, there has be if the wetland does get identified, then we would go through a planning process to identify and designate for the existing or relocated wetland, at, based on the information and reports that we are provided with. There is a water course identified in the secondary plan, but not a wetland feature in itself, such as a core area wetland. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wilson. Thank you. Um, and that wetland has subsequently been identified and deemed to be significant by the HCA. Thank you for the questions and the answers, rather. Thank you to Tim and to Mr. Robichaud. If I could just take a chair back over to Council Wilson for a second. I just have some questions uh, to someone from Development and Engineering. I don't know whether Ben Yu is on the line, but has the applicant made application for the sanitary connection to uh, be um, to service this property? And if so, what's the status of that to bring sanitary sewage down to 140 Garner Road? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, my name is uh, Binu Korya, Manager of Development Approvals, um, to the, to, to the Councillor. So the, the, in accordance with the functional service report, they are actually proposing a pump station at the in front of uh, Garner Road and pumping the sewer to the Garner Road sewer. The Garner Road sewer is actually good, has to be extended up to Highway 6. So uh, that's the uh, sanitary servicing strategy they are actually proposing for this development. So they've already made progress on fulfilling that obligation of sanitary, they're underway to fulfilling that obligation and uh, of bringing sanitary sewer capacity up to that address. Uh, we already actually have a class CA uh, done for Garner Road, and as part of this, the sewer is actually built um, uh, probably very closer to, um, I believe, actually about 500 meters uh, west of R uh, Raymond Road. So that uh, sanitary sewer actually has to be extended further to accommodate this development. Okay, and so they have an application in, and you're considering that now? Um, we actually provide, we received the draft plan uh, uh, in 2018, and we provide the comments. We are waiting for the revised draft plan to prepare the draft plan conditions. Uh, so at the moment, actually, this application in the OLT, uh, and we have to work as part of the OLT to develop the condition so that actually they can extend the uh, sewer to accommodate this development. Okay, thank you. And and so once again, it, it just puzzles me why the, the development industry continues to give us the finger and not allow us to do our job and process the application. And uh, but that's the cards we've been dealt with by the province. And uh, 
and their amendments to the Planning Act and uh, other legislation. So I'll take the chair back. And uh, I see no other people wishing to speak, so I need a move or a second to receive the staff presentation. Moved by Pearson, seconded by Denko. Discussions? Seeing none, all in favor. Okay, I also need my same mover and seconder, if I can, um, just to move things along, to receive the written submissions. Uh, discussions on them? Seeing none, all in favor. And then last one is a mover and a seconder, same ones, if I can, uh, to receive the report. First one is to receive the presentation. This is to receive the report. All in favor. Okay, we'll now move on to applications for amendments to the Urban Hamilton Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw for lands located at 392, 398, 400, 402, 406, 412 Wilson Street East and 15 Warren Avenue. Uh, this was deferred from the April 5th meeting planning committee and uh, staff have recommended again that the application be denied. Uh, does the committee wish to see the staff presentation? If, if you do, we can motion to that or a motion to uh, waive it if you like. I, I'm indifferent as the ward councillor. Councillor Danko. Chair, Chair Ferguson, is the staff presentation the, the same staff presentation that we've already seen for this? There's, there's, I don't think there's anything new that would be presented. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Steve, can you answer that? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, yes, you are correct. This matter was deferred for two weeks in order to provide an opportunity for the ward councillor and staff to meet with the applicant to determine if there was an opportunity to revise the proposal. Uh, a meeting did occur last week, hosted by the ward councillor and at which time the applicant indicated uh, that they were not in a position to be making any revisions to the proposal. And as such, uh, clerks put the report back on the agenda and it is, essentially, it is the exact same report that was previously presented to committee two weeks ago. And there are no, there would be no changes or revisions to the actual written report. Um, and like I said, we did have the opportunity to meet with the applicant last week just to see next steps. And at that point in time, they indicated that they were not looking at making any changes to their proposal. Thank you. Okay, so if, if there's nothing new in the, in the staff presentation, uh, I'm fine with you're that. Moving, we, you're moving, we waive the staff presentation? Yep. A seconder to that, Councillor Partridge, all in favor of waiving the presentation. Okay, and so, um, being the ward councillor, Councillor Wilson, can you just take the chair and I'm just going to give a summary of what happened last week where we had a virtual meeting okay. and we, we, we had some discussions about uh, coming to a, a solution. They indicated that they might be able, they might be prepared to move down one floor, but at seven floors is still it's almost three times the height of it's in the secondary plan. And, and so staff and myself um, felt that there's no further negotiations that's going to be necessary, and we might as well let this be appealed to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Uh, you know, clearly they feel very confident in in uh, in their position before the Ontario Land Tribunal, but it hasn't been tested yet. But one thing I want the public to hear, and I'm going to read it out. It's in their staff report on page 23 of 44, item C, because it's all that you know, they keep talking about intensification, and that uh, this is what we, the, the city council agreed that they wanted no urban boundary expansion, which of course is not, has not gone into enforce and effect yet because the province hasn't approved it. And, uh, and, and so item C reads, intensification and infill development shall be balanced with the Heritage and Historic District of Ancaster. Further guidance for incorporating heritage features design and overall character through infill and intensification is provided uh, in the supporting Ancaster Wilson Street urban design guidelines. The Wilson, they also argue that the Wilson Street secondary plan is outdated. 
Uh, I thought Mr. Robichaud did a great job explaining that it's not. It was a 2015 document that took a couple years to put together. So it's still current and it's still appropriate. Uh, I think that we could put up a good argument at the Ontario Land Tribunal that it is the heritage district of a, of a community that was founded in 1793, the third oldest municipality in the province of Ontario and that the uh, Ontario Land Tribunal should in fact consider the, the heritage intensification and consider the council decision on this, which they're required to do under the act. So at the appropriate time, uh, Madam Chairman, I'd like to move the staff recommendation. Thank you, are there any other speakers to um, on this matter? I recognize, I, I saw Councillor uh, Danko's hand up and then Councillor Partridge, if that's okay. Thank you, Councillor Danko. Thank you, just um, help me out with procedure here. So th this was referred from the previous planning committee. We've already closed the public meetings and submissions from the agent. So all that's on the table right now is the, uh, the report, the that's decision fine. on the report. Yes, that, that is correct. This is Elsie Kelsey. Thank you, Elsie Kelsey. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, listening to uh, to Councillor Ferguson as as the ward councillor, um, you know, I'm prepared to support him here and uh, to deny. I, you know, we we did give the uh, the applicants the opportunity to have further discussions. My understanding is that they were not able to come to uh, to an agreement, although they were fairly close um, in some aspects. My my concern here is, you know, still stands that we just last planning committee received an update on the Ontario Land Tribunal and the mandate that the tribunal has, has been given by the province and a number of the current decisions. And I'll just reiterate, you know, the, the one in Ward 8 that I'm most familiar with was a 30% increase in density. Um, five, how many stories? Five stories in addition to the to height. Um, above and beyond the urban Hamilton additional official plan. So 30% density higher than the urban, the UHOP. Um, so the risk is that if we as a committee deny this, it's appealed, they will be appealing their original application for, I think it was seven and a half stories. And I still think there's a strong likelihood that it will get approved. And that will put into question the entire um, Ancaster Wilson secondary plan and really um, make it much more difficult for us to defend uh, secondary plans going forward um, when they come, you know, when developers ask for a higher density or, or higher height than what's provided because there'll be a precedent here. Um, but having said that, you know, I, I listened to Councillor Ferguson and this Ancaster is uh, an important heritage district and it is a unique community. And uh, I really hope that the Ancaster residents who I know will be involved will be able to articulate that to uh, to the tribunal. And, uh, you know, having, as Councillor Ferguson has said, having a uh, unanimous denial uh, by committee and council, um, maybe we'll have some weight at the tribunal and uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll find out. But that's all, that's all I have to say. Thank you for the time. You must have heard that little phone go off. Thank you. <laughs> You're right on, right on time. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, I voted against this last time uh, when we wanted to, uh, you know, have it opportunity for review, uh, eight stories. And, and, and you know, as, as was previ previously mentioned, Ancaster is a very important heritage district to, to our city. And um, I want to, uh, as, as the councillor for Waterdown, which is also an important heritage district, I want to encourage uh, the residents to really get involved in this OLT hearing and um, to make sure that their voices are, are heard. We have, I've had many over the years where, you know, myself and residents have gone in, in force and, um, and, and the residents have delegated and it is important, really important and, and particularly in this case. So I will be uh, supporting the ward councillor. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Any other speakers on this matter? Uh, councillor Pearson, please. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize. I didn't put it on the chat, but I'm just listening to the comments and and I will too also be supporting the ward counselor. You know, it's a difficult decision and I agree with Councillor um, Banco uh, and, you know, recently uh, an, OMB, an OLT decision made in my ward um, has been, um, um, you know, a sad situation where <clears throat> we had approval for uh, a six story, it's a huge history on it. And uh, the applicant came back with an amended uh, plan for 11 story. It was unanimously turned down by committee and by council and by staff. Uh, it went to the OLT and he received approval. So yes, it's terrifying times right now with the OLT. Um, it really takes uh, power out of the city, um, the city process, right from doing our secondary plans or official plans or secondary plans. It, it really, you know, let's just put both hands behind our back now and hope that we don't continue to fall flat on our noses. And it's really unfortunate. And at this point, I will support the the ward councillor because he best knows the ward. And um, you know, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm fearful that I will be facing similar situations in Ward Ten going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. I don't have any other speakers on the matter, uh, so there is a staff report. And my recollection of the process is that. Um, it is bef before us to consider the recommendation. Um, and I think uh, Councillor Ferguson is so m moving um, to be in concurrence with that staff recommendation and it's seconded by Councillor Partridge. And it carries five to zero. Thank okay, you, Elsa Kelsey. Thank you, everyone. And the chair. Okay, I, I know I fully support this. I prefer to second it, but I don't have a mover uh, if Councillor Farr is not here. Um, does anybody wish to move this on behalf or would we wait till Jason comes back? Councillor Pearson. You're, I apologize, you're Mr. Leaving. Chairman. I couldn't hear the beginning of that. Are we on motions now? Yeah, we're on 11.1. .1. This is the street festival that Jason right. okay. put, put his notice of motion last meeting, and now he's not with us today. Well, and, I have no, and, mm -hmm. and I apologize because I couldn't hear you at the, the first part there. So I'm okay with it. I'd be happy to move it. The waiving of the notice and the motion itself certainly yeah, support. Yeah, we don't, we don't have to waive the rules because it was a notice of motion last time. So okay. you're moving I'll it. Move I'll be it. happy to second it. I'll move it uh, with pleasure for Councillor Barr. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, any discussion on the motion? Councillor Wilson. Thank you. I'm just seeking clarity uh, through the chair to staff on the scope of that, which will be waived. And I'm uh, seeing this, I am supportive of it, but I uh, just want to make sure I understand it because I'm seeing it through the experience of uh, the Lock Street BIA and the cost that was incurred over $30,000 uh, chair to, to close that street down. Um, so it is, uh, the proposal is just to cover the revenue loss uh, in accordance with the parking and not any of the other um, requirements. Is that correct through the chair? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you, uh, our GM Thorne has turned his camera on, so I'll let him answer the question. Or I see Brian Hollingworth has also come on. So lots of staff are prepared mm -hmm. to comment on this. <laughs> so go ahead, Jason, as the GM. Yes, so through the chair, that's correct. So this speaks to uh, metered parking revenues. Um, there are, of course, other costs associated with hosting festivals, policing costs, transit costs, and, and so on. Um, so this relates just to the parking fees that are normally charged. If you're holding a street festival and closing a street, we would normally charge you um, the cost of the lost parking revenues. Uh, so that is what this motion is addressing. Um, I would note that council had directed uh, staff and we are working on it at looking at other ways to facilitate these sorts of street closures and some of the other costs that are incurred. Um, but that's not what this motion is speaking to. This motion is just speaking to the parking revenues. 
Mr. Hollingworth, did you have anything to add? I know uh, GM Thorn covered it all. Thanks. Okay. So uh, thank you. I, I have a yes. I have a supplemental question to that. Thank you. Um, if it's in order. Uh, so I, I know council previously uh, through the chair to Mr. Thorne um, had approved, I thought it was $750,000 to assist in animation and street activities, and things of that order. Um, is that your what you're referencing when you talk about um, being directed to look at other ways and means to possibly facilitate activity? Thank you. Yes, through, through the chair, if you can still hear me, sorry, I was losing bandwidth there, so I just turned off my camera for a moment. Uh, yes, the councillor is correct. Uh, that previous motion where council approved some funding for placemaking and animation, uh, the direction related to street closures was part of that direction. Um, it, was, it was one of a number of things that was included within that. And one final question then, could I ask, uh, you said there is something coming forward and you're um, you're deliberating those opportunities, hoping to identify something to fulfill that. Do you have a timing um, on that to GM Thorne through the chair? Uh, th through the chair, I apologize, I don't, but I could check in with staff and uh, and and update council on what the what the expected timing is for that. I just don't have that information right now. Thank you. Um, the warmer weather is here and we are getting into festival activities, so I would appreciate any insight. Thank you, through, uh, Chair. Thank you to staff. Okay, I have no other speakers requesting to speak, so the motion has been duly moved and second. All in favor? That's carried, so move on to liquor uh, sales licenses. Councillor Wilson, please introduce your motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is to support the issuance of a limited uh, liquor sales license. I believe I'm following um, on the heels of my colleague, um, Councillor Partridge. Uh, she had one in Carlisle. Uh, it's with respect to uh, Steel Town Cider, which um, originated in, uh, from Dundas, whereas Steel Town Cider is operating at 150 Chatham Street, Hamilton, whereas Steel Town Cider began operations in 2017, moved to its current location at 150 Chatham beginning in September of 2020, whereas Steel Town Cider has applied for and received manufacturing licenses and retail endorsements allowing it to brew and sell cider and beer at its 150 Chatham Street location, whereas in addition to brewing cider and beer, the business model has a retail, tourism, and education component, and whereas the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario requires written notice from the Council of the Municipality within which the applicant's site is located, confirming that it has passed a resolution in support of the issuance of two manufacturing limited li liquor sale licenses by the glass for both cider and beer for tasting. Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Hamilton confirms their support for the issuance of two manufacturers limited liquor sales licenses by the glass for cider and beer for Steel Town Cider located at 150 Chatham Street, Hamilton, Ontario. Thank you. Do you have a second for that? No, I don't. Second by Councillor Partridge. Ah, yes. Thank you. <laughs> any other discussion? Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor. Okay, so it's, uh, there are no notices of motion, so general information and other business. Thank you, Governor. There's the outstanding business list. There's, um, I think, two of them. Um, can I have a mover and a seconder to approve the changes in the outstanding business list? Moved by Councillor Pearson. I have a seconder. Okay, Councillor Danko. Okay, discussion on the motion. All in favor? GM Thorne, do you have any updates for us today? 
Yes, through the chair, just one quick update for uh, members of committee as well as the uh, members of the public, and that relates to the, the GRIDS 2 Municipal Comprehensive Review process. Uh, so just to let committee know that the um, as staff had been directed to do consultation on the proposed official plan amendments to implement the, the council approved no urban boundary expansion growth strategy, um, those proposed amendments have now been posted on the city's website. Um, staff are hosting a open house this evening, a virtual open house this evening, uh, to walk members of the public through what those proposed changes are. And they will be before you at planning committee for the statutory meeting on May the 17th. And of course, any members of the public who want to delegate at that time uh, can do so. Um, so, I, and I do just want to quickly thank as well the, the, the planning team who did an extraordinary amount of work to pull all of this together. Uh, that's Heather Travis, Lauren Brates, and uh, Delia McPhail. I think as you see the proposed amendments, you'll see that it is quite an extensive amount of work. Um, and for any members of the public who are interested, um, we have communicated that out through the city's social media channels, through our fairly comprehensive stakeholder list of people who've been interested in the GRIDS process since the beginning. Um, and again, we have that virtual open house this evening, and they will be before you at the May 17th meeting. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, any questions of uh, the GM? Seeing none, a motion to receive then. Moved by Partridge, seconded by Pearson. All in favor. That carries five nothing. Can I have a mover and a seconder under item 14.1 to approve the minutes of April 25th meeting as presented and that the minutes remain private and confidential? And mover and a seconder moved by uh, Wilson, seconded by Denkel. Discussions on it? Any questions on the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor. That carries unanimously. Okay, may I have a move into second to move, <coughs> excuse me, to move into closed session respecting item 14.2 pursuant to section 9.1 subsections E, F, and K of the city's procedural bylaw 21-021 uh, as amended and section 2392 subsection E, F, and K of the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended as the subject matter pertains to litigation or potential litigation, including matters before the administrative tribunals affecting the city, the receiving advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, and to a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on behalf of the municipality or local board. Um, a mover and a second moved by Pearson, seconded by Partridge. All in favor. That carries unanimously. Members of the public, the meeting will continue following the closed session portion of the meeting. When you see the members of the committee rejoin the meeting, the committee will wait up to five minutes upon reconvening in an open session before proceeding with the meeting to provide members of the public and the media time to return. So Madam Clerk, if you could just let me know when we're in camera.
Okay, thank you. So uh, on item 14.2, we're back in public. This is the appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal for refusal of an HCA permit for the lands located at 140 Garner Road, Ancaster. Can I please have a mover and a seconder to approve that directions to staff in closed session respect to report LS22020 and PED22095 A be released to the public following approval by council and B that the balance of the report uh, LS220020 slash PED22096 A remain confidential. Moved by Denko, Councillor Denko, seconded by Councillor Wilson. Um, discussion on it? Yes, Councillor Wilson. Through the chair, I have a question uh, to staff, likely Solicitor McDonald, if I may. Uh, during the public um, delegate, part of the public delegation solicitor, um, a concern was raised um, uh, by uh, an alleged effort of the applicant to consolidate um, two applications. And I was wondering if you could speak to your view on that in terms of public participation access um, rationale. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, um, the consolidation by the tribunal um, is primarily an administrative consideration. It does not automatically follow that matters get scheduled together or collapse together. It merely means that the tribunal recognizes that the matters under appeal are related. Um, as to whether the tribunal would schedule those together and procedurally how they'd structure things, they would determine that uh, most likely at the May 9th case management conference. And I expect the city um, will take a position at that conference with respect to um, how we believe the, co the hearing should be structured. Um, in terms of consolidation, um, in terms of how that impacts the individual residents or participants, um, obviously we can't give any legal advice, but um, they would still be entitled to participate in those matters individually or on a consolidated basis, um, you know, subject to their rights under the Planning Act or the Conservation's Authority Act and other legislation, um, regardless of whether they're consolidated or not. Thank you. I have uh, one further question. It was suggested by one of the delegates, I think, uh, that given um, the age of the app, uh, one of the um, the the application, I think um, three and a half years of age, that it uh, that per perhaps um, it, it it wasn't in keeping with the process. I was wondering if Mr. Robeshow through the chair could comment on offer any planning um, advice on that. Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, or through Mr. Chairman to the Councillor, uh, it's not uncommon when we're dealing with subdivision applications for them to take several years to go through the approvals process. It is a reiterative process that involves the initial submissions, review, and recirculation uh, and resubmissions to occur. Uh, so. Uh, and we had been working with the previous owner of this property through the process in terms of the submission of the various studies and reports and getting revised studies and reports submitted. So from that perspective, it was still an active file. And then it is also, we have had the situation before where a new owner takes, assumes carriage of the file and generally it works with staff to um, resolve the outstanding issues. So from a planning perspective, from a pro planning process perspective, what has transpired here is not out of the ordinary, and it was in full conformity with the requirements of the Planning Act in terms of how the initial application being submitted and then the uh, working through its process. So although it was several years old, it was still considered to be an active file. And we do once a year contact applicants if we feel that a file is not advancing to get their uh, to advise that if they don't um, indicate otherwise, we will proceed to close the file. But in this case, the applicant had indicated they were continuing to work forward on some of the issues. One of the issues uh, relating to the development of these lands in particular was the timing of the Garner Road sewer infrastructure upgrades. So even though this application could advance to draft plan approval, it was also dependent on some uh, larger servicing upgrades that were required. And I think that factored into the owner's calculations, the original owner's calculations, mm -hmm. and how quickly they were moving forward with this draft plan of subdivision. So um, from a process perspective, there the and the, the application, there's nothing out of the ordinary in terms of what was transpired here from a process perspective. Thank you. 
Thank you. And one final question, just for the public record, because it was raised also by the one of the delegates of how will the public be apprised of their opportunities to follow along or and or participate? Thank you. That's my question. Patrick, could you want to answer that? Um, sorry, the question to the chair was in terms of notification of future hearing events. Um, is that correct? Yeah, it was raised. Um, it was raised, I believe, by one of the delegates that um, this is, for, forgive the pun, garnering um, a grow, growing public interest. And uh, there is a public who is not versed, and most of us aren't, in the LL OLT process. How could they follow along um, or how do they gain information about that, the status of the file as, as it goes along? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Through the chair. Um, so um, all the tribunal's files um, are publicly accessible and you can contact the case coordinator on any individual matter for information um, and they can provide it. If you'd like to be advised as the matter moves along, um, you would have to appear at the May 9th CMC and either request status or at least request to be notified of any future notices, hearing dates, et cetera, because um, following that first appearance, the tribunal will only be notifying or requiring notification to those persons um, that would appear and have an interest at the CMC. Thank you. I, I lied. I have one final question um, to the solicitor. Uh, is there a deadline for um, registering for that case management meeting? I think you said it was May 9th. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, in terms of registering for status, the tribunal typically requests 10 days in advance notice. Mm -hmm. um, that isn't automatically disqualifying. The tribunal has discretion to look at that. Uh, but any person who would um, seek party or participant status would be expected to make the request as early as possible. But in terms of simply being notified and observing, um, those persons could simply contact the case coordinator um, or appear at the CMC and request notice of uh, future events if they wanted to follow along. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answers. Okay, we have a, a motion that's duly moved and seconded that the recommendations approved in camera will become public once we um, it goes through council, but the balance of the report will remain confidential. All in favor? Just moving back to open session, there it is. And it's now 11.45, so a motion to adjourn. Moved by Partridge, seconded by Pearson. All in favor? Okay, have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Chair.